There will be several measures to reduce the two-thirds margin on um, the budget. Um, there is going to be a labor business battle that we probably haven't seen in decades, um, where uh, business groups are putting on anti-union measures and labor groups are putting on what will be called anti-business uh, um, things. Um, let's see. Uh, there is a part-time legislature uh, reform measure that will be out there. Um, I would suggest you go to the Attorney General's website. I think there's something like 52 different measures in consideration right now. <laughs> We, we think uh, humbly that that works in our favor, um, that kind of politics. California Forward, by the way, uh, we are supportive of California Forward. We helped start California Forward. We just think we need to do, we need to do that and more um, as to what they're proposing. Um, but with all this different hay haywire stuff going on on the ballot, right, we believe in the legislature, you know, we have another $20 billion budget negotiation likely coming up. Um, so your fees are about to go up a lot more. Um, and uh, so I think there is the fomenting of a voter revolt here. And I believe, or we believe, potentially a constitutional convention is a healthy way to harness uh, that, that feeling. So that, that would be the I, I would add that the, uh, John's distance from the mic is probably the appropriate one. About a foot back, of course. Um, <laughs> any other comments? Go ahead. Uh, just a couple on, on pending measures. Uh, I checked the Secretary of State website last night. There are 84 currently uh, <laughs> title and summary proposals. That's through November 12th. 50 have been analyzed. 34 more are in the process of being analyzed and more are being submitted. So it's hard to say for sure at this point exactly what would be on, on which ballot. But there are also already three measures that have qualified for June. Property tax measure, a California Fair Elections Act of 2008, and the open primary measure, and the $11 billion <coughs> water bond deal will be on the November ballot as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, <coughs> yeah, this is our address to John, but other people should respond too. Um, the figures were given pretty well show that there is a breakdown of California's an ideological level. And if you get uh, volunteer participants, you will actually get the extremists volunteering more, and so you will tend to get the same polarization into the convention that you have. So ultimately, the only thing I see working here is a revolution in the sense of the people saying, okay, a plague in both your houses, uh, you know, the free economy is partly cooperative and partly competitive, have the people going back to Adam Smith who's supporting the free market competitiveness. We have people going back to Karl Marx, though you can't mention his name, who are the cooperative people. We have people going, taking insight from, say, Mahatma Gandhi. These are sort of the major trends. And um, in, in the free speech movement, there was passion. There was uh, a thousand people in Sproul Plaza. There were a lot more than a thousand students at UCB at that time. Essentially, what revolutions are is the people who are fed up, get together themselves, form some type of dual power, uh, get inspired by leadership, and start creating a second system, which eventually, if it wins and is successful, it's because other people come in. And um, we essentially had the, the French and the American revolutions back right before 1800, then we had the Socialism come in with the other big countries, uh, Russia and China, and also the Japanese revolution there. So what we're going to see here is what I call a, a temporalist revolution. That is one which says, look, we want quality in our, the, how we spend time in our lives. That is the basic principle. Money is just a tool, it's an accounting tool. So we're, not, we're, going to, we're fed up with the old economics, we're going to ask, Justice is essentially everyone being able to use their time and have a you know quality life. But and this will occur in the in the developed countries because the panel try to right, because, this. because convergence is necessary. You go to Copenhagen, the whole question around China and the US and the breakdown there is how is convergence going to take place where the developed countries level out their consumption and other countries can come up. And what's um let's put the panel okay, okay, so speak their mind on this. All of your response. This 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 is what I think the big environment is, and until things are framed in this way, I don't
going to, I, I apologize to Lisa, I'm just going to use that to make a quick closing comment on a very different note because we've been somewhat pessimistic about some things and I actually will respond to the call for revolution when it comes to state government, which I talked about, the, the government funding our, our future. I just want to say that I, I, I think the state isn't quite as divided as we make it out to be. Yes, there's heavy liberals and heavy concerns and all that. But if you, again, the state is half of its education, K-12 and higher ed, so let's just take that part of it, although I don't think there's that much divisiveness over transportation either. There is so much more togetherness in this country, in this state, among political parties on education. If you look at the two President Bushes and Bill Clinton's and Barack Obama's education agendas, they're not all that different. Gray Davis's and Pete Wilson's were pretty similar. I've sat in meetings with some of the most famous arch conservatives in this country and with some of the most liberal folks on education, and there's not as much difference as you would think. And there's a lot of very conservative people who think it's nuts that we're not funding the UC Berkeley more and our education system more. So do we need some revolution in other areas? Yeah, I think in this state, and education, which is a huge check what we're talking about in the state and transportation, let's focus on, you know what, we're not quite as divided as we might think we are, and, and so to figure out ways, at least we can say, how do we get a higher education in the K-12 system that works? And I've seen a lot of public opinion polling, which shows that this state is remarkably together when it comes to education policy. And actually, the problem um, is Sacramento, where some of the interest groups are divided at the state side. So I just say that as a closing thing to think about, that as we talk about all this polarization, at least on a huge issue, which is key to state government, I, I'm not quite sure as we're divided as Straight up, we're about 28th in K-12 funding, so we went from 4th to 28th. This but is per capita. That per capita, but the 48th is when you factor in cost of living and compare across the 50 states, California's 48th. The reason I do that, just in fairness, is our, our, our welfare payments, our prison payments, our local government funding, most of our funding is, is very high because the cost of living is so high, so I think it's only fair to judge cost of living. So we're about 28th, 29th in the country, straight up per capita funding, when you factor in cost of living in K-12 for about or 48. By the way, our teachers are some of the highest paid in the country, so you might say, how does that all work out? The answer is, we've got very large classes in K-12, through and so that leads to the result that per capita we're not doing so well. Uh, thanks very much, Ted. John, did you want to chime in? attractions for us of constitutional conventions. There's been 232 of them in U.S. history. So it's foreign to us. Uh, we've had two, as, as um, Elizabeth Hill uh, laid out, but there have been a lot more in other states. And what they found is it's actually a way to break through the, the partisan rancor. Um, that, that there's something special about a constitutional convention when you gather the group of people, especially this way, where they didn't owe their, their presence there to, you know, especially the random selected people, someone funding their campaign and having to get all those promises, they've, they've got this mission to fix uh, the way the state government operates, and that's it. And they either have to go home, or well, either get to go home and explain to their neighbors why they succeeded, or they have to live with the fact that they weren't able to get it done um, and, and explain that to, to their people, which is a much worse story to have to tell. So we think those kinds of forces are a good thing for uh, the let, let me sneak in a question. What are some of the characteristics of states that have recently held constitutional conventions? Are there any as large as California or nearly as large as California? Are they homogenous in terms of racially or politically? Are there any that have the challenges that California may have? Sure. sure. So um, uh, the one I would point to that's most interesting to us was Illinois. Uh, and so this was a convention that happened in 1968. Uh, convention 6... Uh, Call for a Convention 68, convention happened in 69, and it was approved by the lawyers in 70. Um, and 